I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Paul, the apostle, the missionary to the Gentiles, the man beaten, the man imprisoned, the man chased from town to town, the man hunted by Jewish zealots, is still confident that despite these obstacles and despite these challenges, he's still confident that the gospel message contained the mighty power of God to save souls and to change lives. You wouldn't know it just by looking at him. You know, we often use this passage as a kind of a rallying cry when launching a mission work or introducing a program on personal evangelism. You know, the power's in the gospel. It's a, it's a wonderful, it can make a slogan. You know, of course, uh, every missionary, every preacher uh, believes that or would not have gone into this, this type of work. Now there's no denying that the message that we are to preach is the gospel and there is no other message than the gospel. Paul articulates this in Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 to 8. There's no denying that the good news that there is a God and that this God has appeared in human form to die for the sins of all and then resurrect in order to prove that His appearance and message is true and that those who respond to Him with faith will also share a conscious personal resurrection from the dead into an eternal existence in the heavenly realm no longer subject to sin or death. There is no denying that this is a powerful message and it literally transforms lives here even before the final transformation it promises occurs. Now we believe and continue to preach this powerful message, but we cannot deny that we also notice that despite its power, this message is often defeated by things that are even more powerful. Oh, can you imagine? Something more powerful than the gospel? You know, we don't like to admit it. We don't like to admit that this may be true, but we see the defeat of the gospel all the time. For example, you make an attempt at sharing the gospel and you are met with cold indifference or impatience or ridicule. That's a defeat. Or someone you invite to worship comes once out of politeness but never comes back. That's a defeat. Or you study the Bible with someone, you answer all their questions, you respond to all their doubts and arguments, and in the end they reject the entire message and, uh, and the appeal of the gospel and they refuse any further discussion of religious uh, matter. That's a defeat. You know, it's hard for us to accept that the mighty declaration of Paul in Romans chapter 1 16 about the power of the gospel can be defeated. But it can, we see it happening every day. So this morning I want to review with you the most common enemy that regularly defeats the gospel. Perhaps if you are aware of this, it will help you to be more successful in overcoming opposition as you share your faith with others. And I think knowing this has helped me to persevere after many defeats. I have suffered many, many defeats in this area. Now it may be surprising to note that the key ingredient in the message of the gospel, which is love, that's the key ingredient, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life, John 3.16. For God so loved, that's the operating word there, that's the key word, love, that the key ingredient in the message of the gospel, love, is also the key ingredient in the many ways that the gospel is defeated. For example, the love of Satan's lies defeats the gospel. You know, Jesus called Satan the father of lies and the Bible records the first deception coming from him as he lied to Eve in the garden. That lie, which was that God wouldn't punish, that God was selfish, that lie seduced her into doing what was forbidden and brought about the terrible consequences of disobedience to God that we still experience to this day. Satan's lies have continued to be mouthed by someone or other ever since. Now some of the whoppers, you know, the whopper is not just a hamburger, 
uh, the, some of the whoppers or lies uh, that the Bible speaks of. For example, here's one whopper of a lie. There really is no God. This world came into being by itself and mankind is just a product of its natural evolution. People love to believe that lie. The psalmist commented on this lie that was circulating even 3,000 years ago when he said, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So 3,000 years ago, even though they didn't call it evolution, there were still people who'd, who tried to proclaim the idea that there is no God. The reasons for claiming this have changed to suit different societies, but the basic lie remains. It is used to justify the implementation of man's will over God's will in this world. There is no God, there's the lie, so therefore let's just do what we want. Here's another whopper. Jesus Christ is not really God. You know, the first heresies in the church 2,000 years ago, from the very beginning, had this lie as their basis. That Jesus uh, never existed, or that He did exist, but He was only a man, or that He was a spirit, but He wasn't a man. Any distortion of the truth that Jesus Christ is fully God and came in the form of fully man, that's the truth. Anything less or different than that is a lie, and that lie has been circulating a long time. This lie is promoted and supported through any number of philosophies and religions, but the purpose remains always the same, and that is to create doubt about the manifestation of God in human history. If Jesus isn't God, then Christianity is a waste of time and effort, and we are fools for believing it, and the gospel really doesn't have any power, if you believe that lie. Another lie that people love to believe, there is no judgment and there is no punishment. In our age, this lie is promoted in the teachings and attitude of you know, postmodern thinkers who not only refuse to acknowledge God, but also have contempt for the idea that there's even any such thing as right and wrong. I mean, if there's no right and wrong, there's no punishment, because there's no wrong. This is a, a pretty comforting lie because it allows people to choose whatever they want to do without the annoying matter of guilt or final judgment or troubled conscience. Even if I make a quote mistake, it doesn't matter because there's no judgment, there will be no reckoning. Of course, from the beginning, the Bible has addressed and refuted all of these lies. For example, the account of Genesis and Exodus describes uh, in vivid detail, the power of God to create, the power of God to punish, and to reveal His mighty self to man so that there be no doubt as to His existence and to His power. Paul says it in the following verses in, in that chapter we read from, Romans chapter one, this time in verse 19, he says, that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident. You know God because He made it evident to you. He took it upon Himself to make sure that you knew Him. For since the creation of the world, when did we know God? Paul says, well, since the very beginning of the creation of the world, he goes on, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. How have they been seen? Clearly seen. The stuff that you can't see with your eyes is still available to our minds and to our hearts being understood through what has been made, and this is the kicker, so that they, who are the they? The they are the ones who lie and the ones who believe the lies, so that they are without excuse. In addition to this, that Jesus is the divine Son of God, came in the flesh, has been more than adequately documented and in such a way that meets the highest standards of proving anything. I mean, so much so that Peter is quite confident in saying about Jesus, and there is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I mean, if you want a proof text that says the Bible teaches that the only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ, I'll say it again, Acts chapter four, verse 12, you don't need another text, because it says it all right there. And Jesus Himself leaves no room for doubting the fact that there will be a judgment and there will be a condemnation and there will be a punishment and the only way to escape this certain event is to trust and obey Him. 
in preparation for this terrible day, he sent out his apostles and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved and he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Can it be any clearer? Can we twist those words around in any way to mean that those who believe will not be saved or those who don't believe it doesn't matter? Can we twist that in any shape or form to make it say something else? And yet, even with the truth clearly stated, even with the truth supported by eyewitness testimony and a record that has withstood every attempt to defeat or discredit it in the last 2,000 years, some choose to defeat the truth and choose to believe the lie. Why? Why? With all of this staring them in the face, why? Why do they continue to believe the lie? One of the primary reasons, as I mentioned before, has to do with love. People essentially love the lie more than they love the truth. That's why. It's not because the truth isn't true enough. It's not because the truth isn't evident enough. It's not clear enough. It's too complicated. It's not that is that people love the lie more than they love the truth. For example, they love the lie because it allows them to continue enjoying their sinfulness without interference. You know, Jesus said, and this is the judgment that the light, the truth, is come into the world and men love the darkness, that's the lie, rather than the light, why? He answers, because their deeds were evil. The power that the gospel has, among other things, is the power to shine the light into the dark places of your life. That's why people don't like to hear it. You know, if you're a liar, or if you're a cheater, if you are impure sexually, if you're selfish, if you're self-centered, egotistical, stubborn, proud, lazy, violent, cowardly, wasteful, whatever darkness is in your life, the gospel will find it. The gospel will shine the light on it. The gospel will root it out. Not only that, the gospel will also tell you in no uncertain terms what the consequences for your sins are. Paul again says quite succinctly in Romans 3, uh, 6.23, the wage of sin is death. The wage of sin is death. Six words, there's your future, sinners. Those of you who love the lie, he says. Not just physical death, when the soul leaves the body, but spiritual death when the soul is separated from God. Of course, there's also good news that even though God will judge, even though God will punish, the end of that, uh, that uh, verse says, but the, the, the wage of sin is death, but he says, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What do you want? You want to believe the lie? You believe the lie, the wage of sin, that's death. You want to believe the truth? then the wage for believing the truth is eternal life. So faced with this choice, many people choose to believe one of the lies. They believe either, well, there's no God, so therefore I don't have to respond to the gospel. Or they believe there's no Christ, so I'm not responsible to the gospel. Or they believe there's no punishment. It doesn't make any difference if I listen to the gospel or not. Because they love practicing their sins and would rather do this than believe the truth and abandon their sins in response to God's offer of forgiveness. Some folks don't want forgiveness. You realize that? Some people don't want forgiveness. What they want is freedom. They want freedom to do what they want to do. They want freedom to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, so that they can satisfy self, so they can accomplish their will, so they can retain the comfortable familiarity of their faults, their habits, and their secret sins so that they can live comfortably in this world. Basically, when we believe the, God, uh, the, the lie, we're saying to God, you're not going to tell me what to do. You're not my boss, I'm the boss of me. That's what we're saying to Him. This is what they want. And to announce the gospel to them is threatening, it's annoying, it's awkward because for one brief moment they see the truth, they see the light, but they choose to believe the lie so that their world and their place in it will not be upset 
Basically they're saying, I hear you, just leave me alone, I'm good. And the victory they gain is short-lived because what they have succeeded in doing is defeat the effort to save their own immortal souls. Good for you, buddy. Good for you. You've just somehow put the nail in your own coffin. So what do we do? What do we do? Those of us who have wielded the mighty power of the gospel but have been defeated by one who prefers to believe the lie. What do we do? Well, whatever we do, let's not invent a new gospel in order to create a manufactured victory out of a true loss. Let's not begin saying that it doesn't matter what you believe because everybody's going to heaven. Let's not do that. Let's not begin teaching that God chooses some for heaven and some for hell, and so it doesn't matter what we do. Let's not do that. Let's not begin changing the teachings of the gospel so we can eliminate the more humbling parts of it, like baptism, or the more demanding parts of it, like the necessity to be faithful unto death, so that we can include more people and more ideas in the circle of the saved. Let's widen the circle by shrinking the gospel. Let's not do that. Let's remember that we who preach the gospel are also responsible to the gospel and what it says about itself and those who teach it. Let us remember Paul's warning in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. I read that for you. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. Let's realize that we will be defeated at times and when this happens, instead of changing the gospel, let's do the following, shall we? When the gospel's being defeated, let's know when to quit preaching. I don't know if you've ever thought that a preacher would ever say that. Let's know when to quit preaching. You know, Jesus instructed His disciples that they would be defeated at times, and when they did, they were to move on to another town. Mark 16, 11. Now, we're not all traveling evangelists, but at some point it becomes evident that the person you're preaching to no longer wants to hear and no longer cares. Jesus tells us to accept the reality of the situation and let it go. This doesn't mean you quit praying or you quit loving or you quit providing a Christian witness, but at some point we need to accept the fact that they got it. They got the message, they heard you. They just prefer to believe the lie. Remember that book that came out a little while ago about relationships between men and women? I think it was a movie, you know? He's just not, that, uh, he's, he's, he's not into you, he's just not into you. The same thing here, they're just not into Jesus. It happened in my own family once. Someone in my own family said that to me. I was making that mistake. I was preaching, 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 preaching. And they said, hey, literally, these words. They said, hey, I got it. I get it. I get what you're saying. I understand. And when I'm ready, I'll, see, I'll come and see you. But for now, we're good. You can stop now. OK. They haven't come to see me. They still love the lie. What else do we do when the gospel is being defeated in these ways? Well, let's remember and know exactly what our job is. We suffer the defeat of the gospel and think that somehow we have failed or that like the gospel has failed. This thinking happens because we think that the responsibility for the conversion for the believing belongs to us. Wrong. Our job is to proclaim. Our job is to communicate, our job is to share, our job is to pass on the message of the gospel, not to convert. When a person is converted, it's because they believe the message and they respond to it. When a person defeats the gospel, it's because they believe the lie instead of the truth. It doesn't make the truth a lie. 
It doesn't lessen the truth. Either way, our job is to bring the message, not convince others that it's true. We're only guilty if we neglect to bring the message. Knowing this division of labor helps guard against pride when people are converted, and then it guards us against guilt and depression when they reject us. And then perhaps, finally, in the face of defeat, please know what your reward is based on. Your salvation is based on your faith, not the success or failure of someone else's faith. Your faith is what saves you, not if your brother believed or your mother believed or your dad believed. It's if you believe or not. You keep your faith alive and well by proclaiming the message to others whether they believe or not. Jesus said that the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and few are those who find it. Matthew 7, 14. Shall I read that again? It doesn't sound like we were going to be in the majority position here on earth. You know, we read that passage, but we don't believe it. We read the passage and we think, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, but you know, there are 330 million people in the United States and all 330 million of them ought to be Christians. Why? Why, why? why do we believe that? Why, why be surprised when Jesus' words prove true in our efforts at sharing the message of the truth? You know, uh, I'm certainly not the only one, but our efforts at preaching the gospel online, for example, we have a website, you all know about it, Bible Talk, and we've got tons of material. I mean, really, in comparison to other websites, we have huge amount of material there, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of all kinds of things, preaching and teaching the Bible. And Hal and I are, are excited and happy when you know, our traffic ticks up a thousand or two a month. We're thinking, yeah, another thousand, another two, wow, this month, 8,000 people went there to download stuff. We're excited, until I found out that that they have a dog channel <laughs> where dogs are running around and doing things 24 hours a day and they've got a million hits. Of course, it's only dogs watching, but, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Somebody does some dumb thing, sets their hair on fire, 300 million people watching it. We're preaching the gospel and teaching people how to save their eternal souls 10,000 are watching it, maybe. And that's after seven or eight years of lots and lots of work. If we understand this idea, this knowledge should motivate us to try harder and perhaps cast a wider net, knowing in advance that defeats will surely outnumber the successes. He told us, he warned us, he told us, get out there, preach the gospel, spread it, yes. But remember, the way is narrow. Perhaps there is one other thing to remember in all of this, and that is, let's never be the reason why someone else defeats the gospel. You know, sometimes we're the excuse that someone uses to continue believing the lie because they don't see the power of the truth working in our lives. Oh, they hear the words, they see some form of exterior religious activity, they can conclude that we have a religious point of view that we would like to share with them. But perhaps they don't see or hear or experience in us the life-changing, hungering, thirsting, radioactive faith that testifies without a single doubt that something powerful has happened to us and that some, that same power can change their lives as well. If the only thing that non-Christians hear us talk about is to gripe about so-and-so at church, where's the power there? So let's examine ourselves this morning. All this preaching about the power or the defeat of the gospel, how is it affecting you at the moment? What lie are you believing that is stopping you from believing the truth? Is there somebody here in this audience that continues to believe that Jesus is not God? Is there anyone among us this morning that believes that God will not punish? 
Is there anyone that accepts as true that you don't have to obey what the Bible says in order to be saved? That it's not important to repent and baptisms, you know, take it or let Does anybody still believe that here? Or that you can sin and be unfaithful and that God will not care? Does anybody still believe those lies? Will you succeed in resisting the impulse of believing the truth in order to continue in the lie that dominates your life? Or will you let Christ into your heart by faith and express that faith in repentance and baptism and wash away all the darkness that inhabits your soul? You know, Jesus tells us that the first step in the walk of truth the first blow in tearing down the wall of lies that separate us from God, openly acknowledge our faith in Jesus Christ as the divine Son of God. From the first Pentecost Sunday when the whole truth was proclaimed until this very day, people have done this by acknowledging Christ as Lord in repentance and in baptism. A simple thing that is explained so simply and clearly in the New Testament. So I ask you the question of the moment, of course, who will you believe this day? The one who imprisons you in lies or the one who set you free with his death on the cross? Whatever lie has you imprisoned, don't spend another minute believing it. Break free and come to Christ this morning as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.